Good day, I'm Norman Wobberger. In today's video, we're going to look at this projective triple quad formula, or the corresponding affine version, which we'll call the triple spread formula, and connections with circumcircles of triangles, and a notion of curvature. So it turns out that the triple spread formula is a lovely tool for getting at a very important concept from classical calculus, the idea of the curvature of a curve. So we're going to talk about the triple spread formula, which is of course the affine version, the two-dimensional version of the one-dimensional projective triple quad formula. And here is that formula again. The three spreads S1, S2, and S3 formed by three lines satisfy this relation here, which is part quadratic and has also a cubic term, which will be quite important in today's lecture. We're going to talk about the circumcircle of a triangle, and then we're going to get at this idea of curvature. What does curvature mean? First of all, in the context of circles, and then we're going to move towards understanding curvature of curves without any calculus, rather a novel approach. So let me remind you of an important relation that we established a few videos ago. We were talking about the core circle, if you recall, which has equation x squared plus y squared equals x. And its diameter here is the interval 0 to 1 along the x-axis. And we saw that if we had three points forming a triangle that was lying on this core circle, then there was a lovely relationship between the three quadrants, q1, q2, q3 of that triangle, and the three spreads formed by these lines emanating from the origin to the points A1, A2, and A3. More particularly, this quadrant Q1 is exactly the same as the spread S1 here. Spread between these two lines, or if you prefer, the projective quadrants between these two projective one points, same thing, they're exactly equal. Similarly, Q2, this quadrant here, is the same as the spread between those two lines, and Q3, the quadrants here, is a spread between these two lines. And then we saw that the fact that these three spreads satisfy the triple spread formula, combined with this, immediately gives us this relation amongst the three quadrants of this triangle contained in our core circle. So if we have a triangle that's on the core circle, then the three quadrants satisfy exactly this triple spread formula. Now, this circle here has a diameter quadrants d equals 1. Let's use capital D to represent the quadrants of the diameter here. We might well ask what happens to this relation if we dilate the circle. Well, now the fact that this relation is not homogeneous becomes interesting and important because this is quadratic, this is quadratic, but this is cubic. So if we dilate all three quantities by the same amount, we should not expect that the relation continues to hold. It would hold if it was homogeneous, all terms of the same degree. But since it's not, the relation is going to change. That turns out to be an interesting phenomena. So the fact that these two terms are quadratic and this one is cubic actually ends up playing a very important role in a lot of different areas in mathematics. In particular, it gives us a rational handle on curvature. So we're going to ask the question, what happens if we do scale things? What happens to this relationship between the three quadrants of our triangle contained in our circle? So let's talk about dilation by factor d, which is an important kind of transformation in geometry, even though it's not an isometry. It does change our metrical scale, but still it's a very important kind of transformation. So in classical geometry, one writes something like this. Let's suppose that we introduce the notation Greek delta for dilation. Then delta, say, sub d, would be that dilation that takes xy to dx dy. We should think about that as a transformation classically. It's a kind of a mapping or a function. But that approach requires that you have a prior understanding of what a mapping or a function means. And we don't have such an understanding, at least not in great generality. So we prefer, rather, to define 
this dilation directly by a relation like this. Now we just define what it means when we have the two point xy followed by this symbol delta sub d. We declare that this is equal to the two point dx dy. So basically we're just multiplying both coordinates by d. And this is valid for any d rational number. So here for example is a pictorial visualization of what happens when say we dilate by a factor of two. So everything expands just in the usual kind of scaling fashion that you're no doubt familiar with. So that little greenhouse there, everything gets scaled. This point gets to that point, this one goes there, this one goes there, this one goes there. And uh, we get the, the bigger blue house as a result of scaling by two. This is a scaling that fixes the origin, of course. The origin stays where it is and everything else moves away from the origin. So we should not claim that this dilation scales lengths by d. Because after all, lengths are problematic for us in this exact approach to geometry. But we can say that it scales vectors by d and quadrances by d squared. If we look at this vector, say from the origin to 1, then that vector is transformed to the vector from the origin to 2. That's what the scaling does. In terms of quadrances, well we move from a quadrant of 1 to a quadrant of 4. In general, the dilation delta sub 2 will multiply all quadrants by a factor of 4. Here's the official statement there, that the quadrants between a delta d and b delta d is d squared times the quadrants between a and b. That's how a dilation affects our fundamental metrical notion of quadrants. So let's have a look at what this dilation by d does to our core circle. Here's our core circle with diameter from 0 to 1. Right there, that smaller circle with equation x squared plus y squared equals x. And now we want to dilate everything by factor d. In this case, d is roughly a little bit more than 2. So there's the point d on the x-axis. So our dilation takes this point 1 to that point there, keeps the origin where it is, of course, and so it takes this circle here to this bigger circle here. We also see a triangle, a1, a2, a3, which is lying on the core circle. And its image under this transformation, say a1 prime, a2 prime, a3 prime. The dilates of a1, a2, and a3. Forming our new triangle, a1 prime, a2 prime, a3 prime, on our new circle. And you can check that our new circle has equation x squared plus y squared equals d times x. Okay, so what we're interested in is comparing the three quadrants of the original triangle, A1, A2, A3. So let's suppose those quadrants are Q1, Q2, and Q3. We happen to know that since they're lying on our core circle, that these three quadrants satisfy our triple spread formula. And we're interested in deducing something about the three quadrants in this bigger triangle, the quadrants we're calling Q1 prime, Q2 prime, and Q3 prime. So if we let capital D be the square of D, then we know that Q1 prime is D times Q1. Our dilation by D changes quadrants by a factor of D squared, or capital D. So Q1 prime is D times Q1, Q2 prime is D times Q2, and Q3 prime is D times Q3. Great, so what happens to this relation between the Q1, Q2, and Q3? Well, suppose that we multiply this whole formula by D squared. So then there will be a DQ1 here, a DQ2, a DQ3 here, a dq1 all squared, a dq2 all squared, a dq3 all squared, and we're multiplying by a d squared here, so if we want to put a dq1, dq2, dq3 there, we have to divide by a d to make that all work. 
So if we multiply through by d squared, then we can rewrite this equation as q1 prime plus q2 prime plus q3 prime squared equals to q1 prime squared plus q2 prime squared plus q3 prime squared plus 4 q1 prime q2 prime q3 prime divided by d. So here we, the difference between the cubic aspect here and the quadratic aspect here manifests itself in the way that when we dilate we're picking up an additional factor of capital D there in the denominator. Now our triple spread formula really contains a triple quad formula and this cubic term. So if we bring this to the other side then the left hand side is just the quadria of our triangle a1 prime, a2 prime, a3 prime. So we can rewrite this formula as a prime equals 4 q1 prime, q2 prime, q3 prime divided by d, where a prime is the quadria of this triangle. And I remind you that's 16 times the square of the area. So this is a lovely relation that brings the connection between the quadria, the three quadrants, and this sort of quadratic diameter of the circle on which a1 prime, a2 prime, and a3 prime lie. I have to just introduce a little bit of notation for our circle. Here's a circle, a center there. So there's two sort of ways of describing the size of the circle in this rational trigonometry setup. One is to take the rational equivalent of the radius, and the other is to take the rational equivalent of the diameter. Okay, so if we have a circle with equation x minus a squared plus y minus b squared equals say r, then let's call r the circumquadrants of the circle. Traditionally, that would be the square of the radius, the radius squared. We'll call that the circumquadrants. And the diameter quadrants will refer that to be the quadrants of a diameter, which is going to be 4 times r. Because if you multiply a length by 2, the quadrants gets multiplied by 4. So this is r, this is r, so this is altogether 4r in terms of quadrants. So we'll use this notation today that r stands for the circumquadrants of a circle, that's the radius squared, and capital D stands for the diameter quadrants, which is the length of the diameter squared, relating it to classical stuff. But of course, these are really rational quantities which uh, don't depend on any square roots, so they're defined over the rationals. And here's really a restatement of what we've just found. We call this a circumquadrants formula. We have a triangle, A1, A2, A3, and here is the circle that passes through those three points. There's the center of that circle, usually called the circumcenter of the triangle. I remind you that it's obtained by taking the perpendicular bisectors of the three sides. So you take the midpoints of each of the three sides and take a perpendicular line, and those three perpendicular lines meet at this circumcenter. That's the center of the circle which passes through the three points. So if our quadrants are q1, q2, and q3, and if the quadria of this triangle is A, then the formula that we've basically just established here is that the circumquadrants R is q1, q2, q3, over A. And this follows from the formula that we just obtained from the formula for the diameter quadrants, capital D. We saw that that was 4, q1, q2, q3, over A. So if we want R, well, R will be 1 quarter of D, so we just have to get rid of that factor of 4 there. And we get the formula for the circumquadrants of a triangle in terms of the three quadrants and the quadria of the triangle. Very attractive and important formula. 
And I remind you yet again that the quadri is 16 times the square of the area of the triangle. So let's have a look at an example. Here's a triangle, A1, A2, A3, made of points 1, 3, 2, 2, and minus 1, minus 2. The three quadrants of this triangle are Q1, quadrants between here and here, which will be 3 squared plus 4 squared, or 25. Q2, which is this quadrant here, the difference of 2 and the difference of 5, so we'll get 2 squared plus 5 squared, that's a quadrant of 29. And the quadrants between these two points, it's a difference of 1 and 1, or minus 1, so we get 1 squared plus minus 1 squared equals 2. So those are our three quadrants. The quadria, here's the formula for that, that's basically the triple quad formula. 25 plus 29 plus 2 all squared minus 2 times 25 squared plus 29 squared plus 2 squared. And an alternate formula for that, which is often computationally simpler, is to take 2 out of the 3, let's say 25 and 2, and take 4 times 25 times 2, and then subtract the difference between the third one, 29, and these other two, 25 minus 2, all squared. Either way, you get 196 for the quadria. So that's 16 times the square of the area of this triangle. So our formula for the circumquadrants of the triangle is R equals Q1, Q2, Q3 over the quadria A. So 25 times 29 times 2 divided by 196, which is 725 over 98. So that's the circumquadrants of the triangle. That's the quadrants of the circle which passes through the three points. That's roughly has center there, something like this. If we wanted, in a classical sense, the standard radius, usually called the circumradius of the triangle, well, we would have to take the square root of this, take in an approximate sense, because that's really all what we can do and you get some decimal expansion that starts something like this. So here we're moving to applied mathematics. We've left pure mathematics when we're talking about something like this. Here we have pure mathematics. Here we have applied mathematics. Which is all well and good, but it's not really pure mathematics anymore. All right, so very simple and elegant formula, uh, well worth remembering. Now we're going to use that in a slightly reciprocal way. So in classical differential geometry, one defines the curvature, little k, of a circle to be the inverse or the reciprocal of the radius. So little k is 1 over r, where r is the radius of the circle. Now for us, this is a problematic definition because the radius of a circle is problematic. A typical circle requires a square root in order to calculate a radius, and that's not available to us, at least not exactly, so this definition will have to be modified. We'll basically have to square this definition and look at a corresponding quadratic notion. So we call that quadratic notion the quadratic curvature. And in keeping with our general tendency to write capitals for the quadratic analogs of ordinary quantities, we'll write the quadratic curvature to be capital K. And so our definition is going to be that that's going to be the inverse or the reciprocal of the quadrants. So 1 over capital R. This is a rational quantity because the quadrants of a circle is rational. So for example, the quadratic curvature of this circle, x minus 1 squared plus y minus 2 squared equals 5, will be k equals 1 fifth because the quadrants is 5, so 1 over the quadrants is the curvature. So clearly the smaller r is, the bigger the curvature is. So small circles have high curvature. And the bigger the circle is, the bigger r will be, the smaller the curvature is. Big circles have small curvature, little circles have big curvature. All right, so now let's have a look at circle quadratic curvature. So we have a circle, and we might be interested in what is its quadratic curvature. One way of calculating that 
if we don't know what a diameter is directly, for example, if it's just a circle on a page, we may not be able to easily measure a diameter. But if we can find three points on that circle, then we can hope to measure the quadrances between those three points. Therefore, we have a triangle. We can calculate the quadri of the triangle because it's a consequence of knowing the three quadrances. And then we can write down what the quadratic curvature of the circle is. The circle in this case is called the circumcircle of the triangle. Okay, and the formula is that K equals the quadria over Q1, Q2, Q3. And of course it's just the reciprocal of the formula that we've already established for the circumquadrants of that same circle. The circumquadrants was the product of the quadrants divided by the quadria, so the curvature is going to be the quadria divided by the product of the three quadrants. So it's a very lovely formula really, and again brings to the fore the importance of this quadria. Okay, the quadria is 16 times the square of the area, but here it appears very nicely, no coefficients, just the quadria divided by the three uh, quadrants, and that's our quadratic curvature of the circle. And a little exercise to show that you can write this thing in an alternate way using this formula here. All right, this is a very intriguing kind of uh, situation because now we're in the possibility of measuring the curvature of this circle by knowing something about three points on the circle. And the three points can be anywhere they want to be. It doesn't matter where those three points are. This quantity is always going to be the same. In particular, we could choose these three points to be actually quite close together. If they're quite close together, forming a rather thin little triangle, the formula is still going to be theoretically correct. So in, in practice, this gives us a way of effectively finding the curvature of a circle, even if we're only familiar with a very small part of it. This turns out to be an interesting concept because 17th century mathematicians were quite interested in more general curves, and they realized that the idea of curvature applied to more general curves, not just circles. We could ask about the curvature of a general curve at a particular point on that curve. Now traditionally this is part of the story of calculus, but we're going to see that uh, this approach to uh, curvature is actually quite amenable to rational analysis and will give you yet some more evidence of the idea that we can replace a lot of classical mathematics that involves infinite processes and limiting processes with more concrete, finite, algebraic mathematics. And we're going to demonstrate that for you next time by looking at the curvature of a parabola and establishing a famous formula for the curvature of a parabola at a general point without any calculus. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.